So welcome to um, Footloose. This has become a sort of annual uh, um, event, both at the Mothership Jaipur Festival and at the Satellites. I see many uh, previous uh, uh, sinners from this panel uh, uh, left, right, and center around us. Um, and uh, some, of the, some of the people in this panel have, I think, sinned many times on here, particularly Manisha and uh, Pico and Christina. I think Carlo is the only one who to uh, not do London before. So, uh, that is my fire. Anyway, so forgive us if there's any sense of deja vu about this, but uh, it's, always, it's always one of my favorite pa panels. Travel writing is one of the oldest forms of literature in the world. It predates the uh, novel by several millennia. Uh, it's there alongside epic poetry at the very beginning of man's first literary journeys. We think of those cuneiform tablets found in the ziggurat of Ur with the first wanderings of Gilgamesh on it, almost the oldest piece of literature in the planet is a travel story. It's a story of Gilgamesh's wanderings through Mesopotamia uh, and into the underworld. If you think of the Old Testament with the wanderings of the patriarchs or the, um, the wanderings of the Pandava brothers in the Mahabharata, uh, the idea of a journey is a metaphor for something deeper or as a vehicle for carrying a more profound message uh, is something which is, um, ha ha reappears in generation after generation in terms of uh, time, but also uh, geographically in terms of space. This is a genre that has appeared independently in almost every human culture, uh, from Mesopotamia and the Middle East through India to, uh, to Lipo in, uh, in Japan, to the early Arab travelers like Ibn Jubayr or Ibn Battuta, uh, crossing the Mediterranean and traveling through the Arab world, through Marco Polo in the Middle Ages. And then you get, of course, the colonial travelogues often connected and implicit with the expansion of European empires. People like Alexander Burns um, writing their travel memoirs while also acting as an MI6 spy. Uh, and then you get, of course, the generation represented by Pico of, of sort of post-colonial writers who, who, who uh, as he wrote in his own celebrated Times uh, Time magazine cover piece, uh, When the Empire Wrote Back, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, uh, and, and strange um, reflecting mirrors often back on, uh, on Europe uh, and, um, uh, and the travel writing in, in, in these countries. For, I, I, I've even read, I think, Victorian uh, complaints about the ubiquity and sometimes the banality of travel writing. And there's often apologies if you read travel books uh, set in the Middle East in the 1880s, such as Robert Curzon's classic book, Journeys to Monasteries in Levant. He already begins to apologize. I say, there have been so many other travel books written about the Middle East. I apologize for writing a new one. And equally, people apologize for saying that this is now a form which is dead today because we've got Google Maps. You know, how on earth can you need a travel book when you can just look down on your mobile phone from a satellite and see any, uh, any street, whether in London or Timbuktu uh, or Japan? And yet, this genre survives. There's something so elemental about it, apparently so deeply built into our DNA, that it continues. And great travel books continue to be written. Um, some of the most celebrated works of non-fiction of our time, um, ranging from masters, of great heroes of my own, such as Bruce Chatwin, um, such as Patrick Lee Fermor, through uh, figures such as Colin Thubron, to later generation, um, uh, uh, such as uh, Robert McFarlane, whose books like The Old Ways uh, are, are some of the great non-fiction bestsellers of our time, sitting at number one. Uh, on the bestseller list. So this genre defies continual attempts to consign it to the, to, to, to the dustbin, uh, either as something colonial or something defunct or something now, uh, now pointless uh, in an age of, uh, uh, of globalization. The panel we have gathered here today represent different ethnicities, different countries, uh, different points of view, different genders. Uh, but uh, they all have something different to say about the globe, and I think in their different ways, they represent the vitality and diversity 
of travel writing. Some, such as Carlo's, are, are kind of, is a travel book that doesn't really travel. Uh, it sits at home with his wife on the beach in Madras very uh, happily. Uh, uh, others are, 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 are like Venetia's literally across the entire globe. Um, and so you, we have every possible extreme uh, for you in the next hour. I've asked our panelists to prepare short readings each for between five and seven minutes. And we're just going to go from Carlo on the right uh, to Pico on the left um, and kick off with you. You, you. You're sure you want to start with me? I'm sure I want to start with you. Well, we have had a long going debate with William because I, as you have understood, I deny that my book is a travel book. <laughs> but because I am white, then uh, instead of being migrant literature, it's considered a travel book. <laughs> but actually, I've been living in India for 10 years. And this is a migrant memoir of someone who actually has not just learned to bob his head, but <laughs> <laughs> to bribe policemen to stop him when he exceeds the speed limit, which I do regularly, being Italian. <laughs> uh, and so actually, for me, this is the story of how I've Indianized while India is westernizing slowly in the last 10 years, since 2008. Actually, my next, bo next book, which is coming out in October, is a travel book because it tells the story of how I arrived in India in 2008. But what I'm going to read you about is the reason why I'm there, which is that I got married to an Indian woman who in, kept me in India and who happens to be here. And uh, uh, I just uh, will read you a brief excerpt from a chapter which I call my um, Ode to Multiculturalism um, and because it's about our wedding on the beach at the house. If you are sensitive to bad singing, you can leave now because there will be some mild singing here and there. Mild. Mild. <laughs> In several languages. That's why it's my Ode to Multiculturalist. Uh, I have a Jane Gujarati father-in-law, a Welsh mother-in-law. So that's why there was a Scottish uncle dancing with his kilt alongside with my Jane cousins. Uh, but I also had Italians, of course. And so I had a friend called Carlo Monte Carlo who insisted that he wanted to sing Neapolitan songs or opera songs. And I begged him not to do it because I didn't want it to be like one of those soprano New Jersey mafia weddings. <laughs> but of course, the things don't always go as you planned. So this chapter is called My Big Fat Jane Scottish Welsh Venetian Indian Wedding. <laughs> Part of the complex Gujarati marriage ceremony included the fact that I had to leave my slippers by the side of the stage and my two rather athletic sisters would be in charge of preventing the bride's family from stealing them. I had forgotten to explain to my warrior sisters made of strong moral and physical metal that it was more of a ritual, not a game that we had to win at all costs. It was not games without borders, although it most certainly looked like it. But us wildlings from the Dolomitic valleys of northern Italy are renowned for being competitive and fierce to protecting our property. So Maya and Editha, my sisters, were clenching those gilded slippers with all their might, putting my acquired vegetarian Jane cousins into serious difficulty. <laughs> causing a rugby tussle, toppling over cushions and chairs in the general laughter and bringing us back down from the heavens of spiritual remembrances and mystical contemplation of what, what our bond would mean, down to the earthy fact that this was supposed to also be fun. <laughs> and fun it was, especially when my robust sisters stomped on the stage for the next ritual, which gives the name to the expression tying of the knot. It comes from the matrimonial gesture in which the groom's siblings have to come up to the altar and tie one end of the groom's scarf to the end of the bride's sari. The problem is, again, that my Venetian sisters are all about being efficient and are always determined to complete any task at their best. So Edita actually managed to tie such a strong knot using a lot of my golden scarf that not only was it impossible to untie, OK, good omen, but I almost got choked while she pulled, making me cough for help. Bad omen. <laughs> the mantras and rituals were finally over, and it all ended in a marvelous shower of red petals. But dinner had its surprises as well. The Jane family had their own large round table next to the Jane chef's counter, away from the un-Jane food, 
which the hundreds of invitees started sticking their forks and knives and fingers into while some entertainment was provided. First, our English godchild, Milo Ziggy, age three, already musically bent on becoming a rock star, sang a cappella, Lucy in the sky of diamonds, Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Then my friend Peter strummed an Elvis tune on his guitar. Peter is a six foot four, half Japanese, half Belgian, who likes to wear fake sideburns and go beep bop lula, a remnant of his ancient busker days while growing up in Brussels. And Editha, my sister, who's a Mozartian voice soprano, had prepared a duet with Carlo Montecarlo, my Italian tenor friend, in honor of our house to sing Arlanimor, the Welsh name we gave to our home on the Bay of Bengal. Because there is such a song in Welsh which croons of that Arlan i Mor, that place beside the sea where red roses are growing and I've been able to make them grow, where white lilies are showing and we've got white frangipani trees, where the beauty of these flowers is telling and when, where my true love sleeps within her dwelling. But in Welsh, it all sounds like this. Arlani mor me rosis cochion, Arlani mor me lilis gwynion, Arlani mor men garia dinne. See, it's not the easiest sound to pronounce for two Italian opera singers. But they were managing just fine until my sister squawked out a high-pitched sound which the Welsh girls, my mother-in-law's sister and her childhood friends, did not seem to recognize as properly Welsh. As my sister Edita kept coughing, we realized, as she explained later, that a mosquito had flown right into her throat and got stuck there, putting an end to this tearful, nostalgic song. Then, as my best man Fabrizio was droning on a passionate and ironic speech about our friendship and my love for Tishani, the electricity went off. <laughs> Current gone. It all fell into darkness out there beside the sea. We suddenly heard the slow breathing of the ocean and waited for the generator to kick in, which it didn't. <laughs> From the corner of my eye, I saw Carlo Monte Carlo jump to his feet. No, I thought, he's not going to do it. I warned him not to do it. I begged him not to do it. Oh, sole mio, sta in fronte a te. Oh, quiche tu sole. Yes, he was doing it. A cappella, no music, in the darkness, to the awe of all our friends and family, he delivered the most heartfelt and most heartbreaking O Sole Mio I've ever heard. A song about the sun, about light, about love shining like a bright sun, right there in that seaside darkness, current gone, generator off. And when he hit his final line, time front, along with the roar of a very loud and long applause, the light magically came back and the dances started. Power back. Uh -huh. you know gonna... Should we hope you're going to sing too? Or... <laughs> um, I'm neither going to sing nor stand up because I don't, don't want to give birth too early. So I'm going to stay seated. Um, oh, hang on. Can you, can you hear me okay? Oh, now you can. One second. I'm just going to readjust this. Uh, you need to put it a little higher. Yeah, I think it's just dropped off. Ah, brilliant, thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a segment from my latest book, which is Around the World in 80 Trains. Uh, my first book was Around India in 80 Trains, and I felt after a couple of years that I needed to try and replicate what I'd done, but I couldn't come up with any one country where I could find the kind of madness and joy and just complete insanity of being on Indian trains. Uh, so I realised that if I was going to try and find that anywhere, then it had to be a sort of global on a global scale. So I spent seven months traveling from London, as far as I could get really, and then back home again before our funds had run out and my patients had worn thin and I'd got tired of rocking to sleep every night. Um, but the chunk that I'm going to read is when we decided to take the train through Xinjiang province in the northwest of China uh, on the way back home, uh, which we'd been told not to do. We were told that it was very unsafe, that we'd be attacked by Uyghurs. Um, this was all information provided by China's government news agency, so we decided to take a risk and do it anyway. Uh, we were told, so I had a photographer traveling with me who was uh, someone I'd actually met on a train in India a few years before that, and he'd been told to shave his beard off before we actually arrived in Xinjiang province because he'd be arrested and we'd have to pay a lot of money for him to get out of jail. Uh, so he was uh, quite stressed at, at this moment. For the next two days, 
Mark wavered between wanting to shave off his beard and not wanting to shave off his beard, eventually deciding that if we were going to get stopped, arrested, mugged or stabbed, it was unlikely to be the result of his facial hair and more because we were three wealthy foreigners carrying expensive cameras and equipment. On the train to Turfan, we were sitting quietly in our compartment, a cosy little hub with camels embroidered on net curtains. Mark was editing his photos while Jem was reading Colin Tubron's Shadow of the Silk Road and I was typing up some notes when a big round face appeared at the glass. Pulling back the door, the woman walked straight in, pointed at my computer and started chatting away, smiling so hard that the apples of her cheeks looked like two actual apples. What is she saying? Mark said, taking off his headphones. I have absolutely no idea, but she seems to be in a really good mood. She and none. Looking at the lady, whose soft brown scalp was showing through her shorn hair, I saw that she was wearing burgundy robes beneath her mustard overcoat and concluded that she was indeed a Tibetan nun. She was still talking, clutching a flask of tea in one hand and gesturing towards me, breaking into giggles and asking some sort of question. Slapping her thigh and laughing in frustration, she turned to both Jem and Mark for help, asking again the same question until I caught the word Indian. Yes, Indian, I said, pointing to my chest. And he's half Indian, I added, pointing to Mark. The nun grabbed my finger, erupting with joy. Waving her hands and chattering, she pushed Mark's pillow to one side and sat down, the revelation inspiring another monologue. What on earth is she saying, Mark asked, sitting up and trying to slow her down. Jem had disappeared to the next compartment and returned with a nervous-looking, heavily pregnant young woman. I'd noticed the trains were full of heavily pregnant young women, and I realise now that it because simply they couldn't fly after a certain point. She speaks English, Jem said. She's offered to translate. Perching warily on the edge of the berth, the young woman listened for a few moments and then turned to me. She wants to know if you are from India. Yes, I am, I said, deciding that it was safer not to complicate matters by throwing English into the mix and disappointing the nun, who I could see wanted more than anything in life for me to be from India. Translating, the young woman started to laugh as the nun bounced on the seat, threw her hands in the air and then lurched forward to grab my arms. She is very pleased that you're from India. India is, ki is kind to Dalai Lama. You are the first Indian she meets. You are special, she says. We've just been to Tibet, said Jem, showing her a photo on his phone. This was too much for the nun, who broke into laughter, her eyes disappearing into creases. Mark opened up his computer to show her the rest of the photographs of the Batala Palace, as she sat on her hands and chuckled like a child, pointing at the screen with delight. I love how happy this woman is, Mark said. It's amazing, she's only got happiness. From the time the nun had poked her head in through the door, the compartment had radiated with warmth and laughter. We had no idea what she was saying, and she had no idea what we were saying, and the poor pregnant woman was struggling with all of us. But through gesture, facial expression, and touch, we'd managed to establish a mutual understanding. The nun took out her iPhone 6 Plus and began scrolling through photographs of young monks in training and elderly monks taking selfies outside the Drigung Till Monastery in Lhasa. Mark leant forward to look at the screen. She's on WeChat. Tibetan nuns on WeChat, having a conversation with another nun. WeChat was the most popular Chinese messaging service and the three of us had been using it instead of WhatsApp since our arrival. Picking up my phone, the nun signaled for me to add her as a contact. Unsure how to search for her username, which was in Chinese script, I handed her my phone and she instantly opened up the settings, showed me how to scan the QR code and handed it back to me with a nod and a laugh. She pointed at my phone and I looked down to find she'd already sent me a message, an emoji of a golden Buddha that exploded with light, turning everything I knew on its head. If I had to rely on a Tibetan nun to show me how to use my iPhone, nothing could ever surprise me again. <laughs> this uh, is from an old book called City of Jinns, um, which is about Delhi. Uh, and. Um, a rather different Delhi to the Delhi just described by Rana uh, in, uh, in his wonderful capital that he was uh, doing a session on upstairs. 
Um, this is the Delhi of, of 1992, before pollution, before Modi, before Indutva. Um, but it's still the Delhi which was traumatized by partition. Uh, and Rana puts that trauma of partition down as, in a sense, the key fault line that runs through uh, modern Delhi and the, uh, and the cause of so much incredible violence in that city, whether domestic or communal uh, or otherwise. And when I was first in, living in Delhi as a young correspondent, um, reading its history, I couldn't reconcile these incredibly grand mogul past with these stories of these great poets, the incredible adab and, uh, uh, and refined etiquette of the mogul court, the fact that Delhi Urdu was meant to be this incredibly refined uh, version of the language, like Tuscan and Italian. The, um, and um, yet when one moved around the city, this was a, an ebullient, lively Punjabi city full of, uh, full of uh, uh, good living, um, uh, fairly uncultured Punjabis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> With many honourable exceptions, uh, and uh, 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 and uh, I began to explore this, and the path led eventually back to Karachi, where, of course, many of the old Delhi elite had emigrated to, whether by choice or being driven out of the city in the riots of partition in 1947. And in particular, I wanted to meet one man who was the great chronicler of Delhi from that period, a wonderful writer called Ahmed Ali. Uh, and Ahmed Ali had written the book uh, Twilight in Delhi, which was published by Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster in the Hogarth Press, and was really one of the very first, along with uh, Mukraj Anand, was one of the very first uh, Indian novels in English to get widespread critical attention in the West. And it is a masterpiece. It stands out today. It wasn't a, a piece of sort of sympathy uh, or exotica publishing. It's a masterpiece. It's a, an incredible portrait of, um, uh, of old Delhi, uh, an old Delhi which had already gone through the trauma of 1857 uh, and was about to go through the second trauma of 1947, 1857 being the Indian Mutiny, 1947 being Partition. Uh, and Ahmed Ali was clearly a man who loved every stone of the city of Delhi and in his book uh, is already an elegy to a city which, while alive, is, is dying and, he, and he's anticipating that end in the 1930s when he's writing. Uh, but he didn't live there. And I eventually found through a publisher friend that he actually was living in some obscurity in Karachi. And although he'd published uh, in America a book of Urdu poetry translations, uh, no other book by him had been available. And you know, there was this great gap of uh, 40 years between 1947 and when I was, uh, when I was uh, looking for his work uh, in, the early, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. So I went to see him and tried to find out what had happened. You need post-it notes. I do need post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> Ahmed Ali was there to meet us. He had severe black-rimmed glasses, above which sprouted a pair of thin grey eyebrows. Mm. He slurred his consonants and had the slightly limp wrist and effete manner of one who modelled himself on a Bloomsbury original. <laughs> For a man once seen as a champion of Delhi's culture, a bulwark of Eastern civilization against the seepage of Western influence, Ahmed Ali now cut an unexpectedly English figure. With his clipped accent and tweed jacket and old leather elbow patches, he could have passed off successfully as a clubland character from a Noel Coward play. Despite his comfortable, well-to-do appearance, Ahmed Ali was an angry man. Over the hours I spent with him, he spluttered and spat like a well-warmed frying pan. The first occasion was when I inadvertently mentioned that he was now a citizen of Pakistan. Poppy got bald and ash, he said. I was always against Jinnah, never had any interest in Pakistan. Steady on, said his friend, Sharnal Haq. The devil, said Ali. Pakistan's not a country, never was. It's a damned hodgepodge. It's not your country or my country. He was shouting at Sharnal Haq now. It's a country of a damned bunch of feudal lords, robbers, bloody murderers, kidnappers. 
the outburst spluttered out into silence. But, I ventured, didn't you opt for Pakistan? Surely you could have stayed in Delhi had you wanted to. There was another explosion. I opted for Pakistan, I did not. I was the visiting professor in Nanking when the blasted partition took place. The bloody swine of Hindus wouldn't let me go back home, so what do you mean? I went and saw the Indian ambassador in Peking. Bloody, bloody swine said I couldn't return. Said it was a question of Hindu against Muslim and there was nothing he could do. I was caught in China and had nowhere to go. Careful, said Sharnal Haq, seeing the state his friend had worked himself up into. So how did you end up in Karachi, I asked. When my salary in Nanking was stopped, I found my way to some friends in Hong Kong. They put me on an amphibious plane to Karachi. Where else could I have gone if I couldn't go back to Delhi? Ali had now ceased to quiver with rage and was now merely very cross. I never opted for Pakistan, he said, gradually regaining his poise. The civilization I belong to, the civilization of Delhi, came into being through the mingling of two different civilizations, Hindu and Muslim. That civilization, that culture flourished for 1,000 years undisturbed until certain people came along and denied that that great mingling had taken place. Views like that can hardly have made you very popular here, I said. They never accepted me in Pakistan, damn it. I've been weeded out. They don't publish my books. They've deleted my name. When copies of Twilight in Delhi arrived at the Karachi customs from India, they sent them back. So that the book was about the forbidden city across the border. They implied that the culture was foreign and subversive. Ah. In that case, I said, couldn't you just go back to Delhi now? Couldn't you reapply for Indian citizenship? Now, no country is my country, said Ali. Delhi is dead. The city that was, the language, the culture, everything I knew is finished. It's true, said Shanul Haq. I went back 13 years after partition. Already, everything was very different. I stayed in a new hotel, the Ambassador, that I only later realized had been built on top of a graveyard where several of my friends were buried. In my mohalla, everyone used to know me but suddenly I was a stranger. My haveli was split into 10 parts and occupied by Punjabis. My, house, my wife's house had become a temple. Delhi was no longer the abode of the Delhi Waller. Even the walls had changed. It was very depressing. Before partition, said Ali, Delhi was a unique culture, a unique city. Although it was already very poor, still it preserved its high culture. That high culture filtered down even to the streets. Everyone was part of it. Even the milkmen could quote meal and dag. The prostitutes would sing Persian songs and recite Hafiz. They may not have been able to read and write, but they could remember the poets. And the language, said Shanul Haq. You cannot conceive how chaste Delhi Urdu was. And how rich, said Ali. Every mahalla had its own expressions. The language used by the ladies was quite distinct from that used by the men. Now the language has shrunk. So many words are lost. We talked for an hour about the Delhi of their childhood and youth. We talked of the eunuchs and the Sufis and the pigeons and the poets. Of monsoon picnics in Meroli and the jinn who fell in love with Ahmed Ali's aunt. We talked of the sweetmeat shops that stayed open until three in the morning, the sorcerers who could cast spells over whole mahallas, the possessed women who used to run vertically up the Zanana walls, and the miraculous cures affected by Hakim Ajmal Khan. The old men swam through great oceans of nostalgia before finally coming ashore on a strand of melancholy. But all of that is no more, said Ali. All that made Delhi special has been uprooted and dispersed. Now it is a carcass without a soul. I am a fossil, said Ali, and Sharnal Haq is on his way to becoming a fossil. <laughs> but nevertheless, I said, if you both love Delhi so much, wouldn't you like to go back and just see it one more time? 
I will never see that town again, said Ali firmly. Once I was invited to give some lectures in Australia. There was a mechanical fault and the plane was diverted to Delhi. The plane landed, but I refused to get out. I said, I'm not getting out. I don't have to. You call your damn chairman, but I'm not putting one foot on that soil, which once was sacred to me and now has been desecrated. They got the entire staff of the airport there to get me out. <laughs> but I didn't move. How could I? How could I revisit that which once was mine and which was no longer mine? When they asked why I was behaving as I was, I simply sat in my seat with my seatbelt and quoted Mir Takimir with them. <laughs> what matters it, O oh Breeze, if now has come the spring? When I have lost them both, the garden and my nest. What happened, I said. The swine were all Punjabi, said Ali. Tell you the truth, I don't think they understood a bloody word I said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Follow that. <laughs> so like Carlo, I'm not a travel writer, um, but I love travel writing, and I feel honoured to be on a panel with some of my favourite travel writers, and see some of my other favourite travel writers in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I just want to wish all the fathers here Happy Father's Day and thank people for coming out because I believe there's a kind of sports match going on today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sports match? Some kind of cricket match, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to read something uh, from an article about a train journey in Africa between a town in northern Zambia and Dar es Salaam. It doesn't feature any singing, fortunately for you, <laughs> but it may feature some dancing. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I should have realized it'd be no ordinary journey when I telephoned to Zara reservations and a giggling voice answered, here is beauty. When I explained I was calling from Portugal, beauty was very excited. Portugal, she said in wonder, what time is it? When we established it was the same time as in Zambia, Beauty was astonished. Someone called Precious came on the line, equally amazed. Then it went dead. <laughs> After several conversations, which never got near reserving a compartment, I gave up and decided to try my luck on arrival. The Tazara train goes from Zambia ta to Tanzania twice a week, and its motto is on time all the time. So on the Friday morning that I arrive with my boyfriend at Mpika station to buy our tickets and catch the afternoon train, we were confident of soon departing. 40 hours later, <laughs> we were still waiting. <laughs> now, 40 hours is a long time, even for those used to the vagaries of England's, uh, this shows how old this is, Connect South Central. <laughs> it is a very long time in Mpika, where the concrete road from the station peters out after 50 meters into red clay dotted with shacks. Few tourists ever stopped there, and we were soon the object of fascination. People popped up from nowhere to tell us about Chinese railway workers breeding dogs to eat for dinner. The one-eyed station master confided his dream of becoming a marketing executive. A group of evangelists with black briefcases tried to convert us, and a man asked my boyfriend Paolo how many cows he had paid for me. <laughs> we hung out in Kalolo's bakery, the only cafe, where we introduced the custom of halving scones and spreading them with butter. And we bought the only painting off Kalolo's wall. News spread, and we were besieged by people trying to sell us other things, land, baskets, and brown pebbles. By the time the train came at 4 a.m. on the second day, we had many new friends. <laughs> We were, however, seriously short of, sh of sleep and dreaming of our first class sleeper compartment, which we had paid to have to ourselves. So when I slid open the door and nine smiling Zambians <laughs> stared out, my heart sank. <laughs> Come in, they called, apparently well into their second case of Mosi beer. Sharing a compartment for two with nine other people who are drunk and want to party when you want to sleep is not conducive to international relations. <laughs> Grumpily clearing people off our bunks, we covered ourselves into Zara blankets and tried to sleep. 
At 6 a.m., the radio came on, blaring out music. One of our new bedfellows opened the blinds and announced it was time for breakfast. Barely conscious, we stumbled along the corridor to the dining car for rubbery omelettes and grey tea. Everyone else seemed to be in their best clothes. Men in shiny shoes, spotted bow ties and colourful shirts. Women with complicated headdresses, putting us, the only white passengers, to shame in our dusty jeans and t-shirts. Back in the compartment, our fellow passengers introduced themselves and apologised for the previous night. I apologised for my bad mood. They handed us beers and we were all friends. They were travelling to Dar es Salaam to buy car parts. In Zambia, they cost five times more because of high import tariffs. What about customs? I asked Chola John, the leader of the group. We have an arrangement, he smiled. <laughs> the day got hotter and the music louder. More beers were drunk. We stopped at villages of beehive huts and acacia trees. Suddenly, Chola John's wife, Joan, slid her ample frame off the seat. Time to dance, she shouted. Yes, 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 yelled Chama, a big bottom school teacher. Soon everyone but us was dancing. Christine, you will show us how people dance in London, commanded Moses. <laughs> Never the most elegant of people on the dance floor, I shuffled my feet in embarrassment. My audience was not impressed. Christine, we will teach you to dance like an African mama, they said. Soon the whole train had heard about the white woman trying to dance the African way. People came and offered advice, but it was no good. My hips refused to sway like theirs. Paolo, my boyfriend, who is dusky and Portuguese, kept getting mistaken for the Zambian Minister of Agriculture <laughs> and was thus excused from dancing. <laughs> we were both relieved when lunch was announced. In the dining car, everyone we met told us they were off to Tanzania to buy car parts. Having resolved to be late, the train fell further behind schedule. By the second day, the water ran out, so we were not only drinking mosi, but brushing our teeth in it. The stream of visitors to our compartment to watch me try and dance continued. <laughs> On the third and last day, as the train crossed into Tanzania and the beer switched from Mosi to Safari, we hogged the window seats, pointing at the Maasai with their cattle and hoping to see wild animals. How is the bush in Portugal? asked Chola John. Do you have giraffes? Before we could answer, the radio, which had been mercifully silent, started blaring again. Time for dancing, shouted <laughs> Moses. <laughs> I thought I would save you from a demonstration. <laughs> the floor's here? <laughs> uh, I think I need a few drinks. <laughs> I'd rather do some Zambian beer. Yes, <laughs> 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 first up. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so I did most of my travel writing in my 20s, and it had a rather antic knockabout quality uh, in deference to my heroes of the time, uh, Monty Python. And then my writing took a rather dangerously serious turn. So my most recent book, which just came out called Autumn Light, is about the very exalted theme of ping pong in Japan. And uh, I am the lone foreigner in a circle of 30 uh, ping pong players. Uh, at my towering five foot seven and a half, I'm almost the tallest in the whole group. Uh, in my 50s, I was the youngest by many decades. Uh, and when my wife at once looked in on the ping pong proceeding, she realized to her horror <laughs> that her um, hairless, hapless husband was a sort of Justin Bieber figure, uh, a teen idol next to my octogenarian friends. Uh, at the same time, I always remember that in Japan, they always say, that life is about joyful participation in a world of sorrows. And so the, I write in this book about autumn reminding us that everything passes and ping pong reminding us that joy is here at every moment. And I think maybe in deference to Monisha and the multicultural theme that we've had so far and um, the Indian tent, I'll read uh, just a little passage about when my wife and I go and look in on the Dalai Lama in Kyoto, Japan, uh, and remember a trip we'd made with him two years earlier. Uh, every November, the Dalai Lama visits Japan, and every November, we travel across the country with him. As we say hello to the Dalai Lama, I recall the November day 
two years ago when we traveled up with him to a fishing village north of Tokyo laid waste by the tsunami of eight months earlier. A few miles out of the city of Sendai, we began passing along clean, modern roads lined by nothing but compacted trash, block-long rectangles of smashed cars and refuse, telephone poles listed at 45-degree angles, a solitary chair sat in the skeleton of what had once been a living room, buses bobbed on the water beside us. When we pulled up at Ishinomaki, hundreds had gathered along the road to greet the famous visitor. It was to see nothing but a flattened landscape that looked like pictures I'd seen of Hiroshima after the war. More than 3,000 had lost their lives in this village alone, many of them children. 19,000 had lost their homes. The Dalai Lama stepped out of his car and strode without hesitation to the people, mostly women, who had assembled in the streets to see him. Many were sobbing or calling out in limited English, thank you, thank you. He held one person's head against his chest. He blessed another. He touched heads, shook hands, looked into one set of eyes, then another, asking, what do you feel? Are you still sad? Please, he told them, as the women sobbed and others pushed forwards, please, be brave. Please, change your hearts. You cannot change what has happened. Please help everyone else. Help others become OK. The crowd fell quiet. Some of its members nodded. Too many people died, he went on. If you worry, it can't help them. Please, work hard. That's the best offering you can make to the ones you lost. Rebuild your community as your country rebuilt itself after the war. It's the kind of advice that anyone might give, perhaps, but when he turned around to walk towards the temple that had survived, gravestones in the foreground tilted crazily over or knocked down entirely, I saw the Dalai Lama take off his glasses and wipe away a tear himself. <coughs> Suffering is the central fact of life from his Buddhist viewpoint. It's what we do with it that defines our lives. Just one day later, we return with the Dalai Lama and his bodyguards to the hotel, hasten up in the elevator to the top floor, and walk at high speed down the corridor with him to his room. His eyes are often red after a long day of events, but his pace never slackens. He's holding Hiroko's hand as he moves forwards. As in some physical expression of his teachings, he reflexively reaches for any set of hands to grasp between his own as he strides along. Just before we arrive at his door, his Hiroko says, uh, Your Holiness, we must leave you now, but thank you for everything. He's on his way to Tokyo next day. We have obligations at home. Also, she says, and her voice begins to falter just a little. I want to tell you, my father passed away this year. Instantly, the fast-stepping monk stops. He looks at her directly. When? This year. What cause? No cause. He was old. His body was tired. He steps forwards and holds her for a long, long time. Then he steps back and looks searchingly at her. Remember, only body gone, spirit still there, only cover gone. Then he heads into his room and at the threshold turns around to wave at us briskly, good night, thank you, and then is gone as we head back into the golden flares of late afternoon. We have a little time for questions. I think uh, Ahmed Ali's book got a second lease of life thanks to City of Jinns. 
<laughs> they get reprinted. Yes, I, yeah, I, 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 I read it then. But may I just make a little ob observation, please? I don't think it was very representative of Delhi at all. It was about his neighborhood in Delhi. It was literally his mohalla and nothing else. That's a fair criticism, yeah. <laughs> but a very beautiful micro study. Yes, it was a micro study. Thank you. As you mentioned, there's a whole lot of colonial writing. And you recently edited the book on Fanny Parks. I'm uh, curious to know what is it that made you choose that particular one? And what is it that struck you and made you go for it? So I think um, there can be value in, 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 in good writing, whatever it's, how, however tainted its source. Um, spectacular writing um, from wars, uh, spectacular writing from, from uh, parts of the world that we might not uh, approve of in all sorts of other ways. But the, uh, and I think the same is true of colonial sources. I think to um, dismiss them bag and baggage in a Saidian uh, 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 eviction um, because they're uh, colonial is, is a mistake. I think we should judge them as, uh, like we judge other literary works. Uh, and for me, Fanny Parks is, is, sim is just simply one of the most wonderful uh, depictions of India from any century. Uh, and one of the most cheering depictions from the colonial period. Here is an English woman who breaks free from her boring husband, who goes off on her own, enters harems, spends time, makes friends, learns the sitar, uh, learns the languages, rides on, rides on horseback from one end of India to another on her own. Uh, and gives an incredibly positive and enthusiastic picture, as well as having sort of spectacularly important historic encounter, encounters with you know, the inhabitants of the Red Fort, with mixed, uh, the mixed household of uh, William Linnaeus Gardiner, an American Bostonian thrown out of, born on the banks of the Hudson, thrown out of America after Yorktown and the victories of the Patriots, married to a Shia Begum of Cambay and, now, and buried on the banks of the Ganges. Uh, I mean, these extraordinary, exotic and complicated and unlikely conjunctions with children who had mixed Mughal and British names. So one son was called James Jahangir uh, Shiko Gardener, uh, and so on. So, you, I mean, so, so it's an insight. I mean, what travel writing can do, I think, historic travel writing, uh, is it can uh, illuminate the parts that most history books miss. Uh, the everyday life, the the uh, the mundane. What it gives you a better feeling than most narrative histories of what it's like to live in a particular period, uh, to to be a human being at a moment in time and space. Uh, and Fanny Parks does that very well. I'm planning this summer actually to ha uh, edit a companion volume um, from um, a more complicated source, which is the her. Uh, uh, a, 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 a pair of sisters who greatly disliked Fanny Parks and who, uh, uh, and who the two Eden sisters, uh, Fanny and Emily. Uh, Fanny was from a, uh, Fanny Parks was from a, a, a rather junior part of the civil service, and uh, the two viceroys, two governor generals' sisters, uh, did not approve of Mrs. Parks gallivanting on her own. Probably rather jealous. Uh, and um, on top of the two Eden sisters, there's their cousin William. And they write from, from the very tier, top tier of uh, a, a governor generalship that is about to hit the rock spectacularly in Afghanistan when uh, poor, dear, peaceful um, brother George uh, declares war most uncharacteristically, as, as Emily writes. Uh, and uh, of course, the whole army is then wiped out in Afghanistan. Um, and so it's, an, a, 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 again, you know, a fascinating insight into, into a lost bit of society. Uh, but uh, Fanny remains my favourite and, uh, uh, and, and one I'm very fond of. Can I make a comment on, on that? Um, I've got my ear, I think. When I, I started out as a journalist in Peshawar in 1987, and so I bought everything I could to read about Afghanistan and Northwest Frontier. And the best things I found to read were books written by very colonial people who had been political agents in some of the tribal areas 
who had such phenomenal knowledge of the tribes and the intricacies of life in those areas, because they you know, lived in one agency um, and they spent years there and they were amazing books. And I felt years later when um, British troops went into Afghanistan in 2006, that was the huge difference, that there was no knowledge, no background, and yet here we were a country that should have had that, that we'd had these people who, um, you know, I remember reading one where it, it mapped out every relation of everybody in the village to everybody else, and uh, it was so opposite to the way that our troops went in, knowing actually just thinking bad guys are Taliban and good guys are everyone else. Amazing how quickly a body of knowledge yeah. can be lost in a generation. That so, you know, I do think there is some value to colonial sources. You've got to declare yourself first as who you are. <laughs> I'm Papa Rajesh. Um, I just wanted to congratulate Carlo for uh, surviving in Madras for the last 10 years. Not, not for the singing, then. <laughs> and I'm sure you've been woken up with megaphones at 6 a.m. in the morning from the local temples. <laughs> now, you, you read all about it there. Yes, what I want to ask you is that what do you think the future is in the, for the next 10 years now that we've got a new the government back and the new government, albeit a little bit of change, in Tamil Nadu? Well, first of all, I think that the new government in Delhi is renewed for just five years, so not for 10 years, so we, we can look at the next 10 years. But I think that in the South, the DM, DMK has shown, this is a political question, right? You want to know? Uh, I don't think that there is much of a change because from what I have my, I've experienced through the administration of Karuna Nidhi and Jayalalita, uh, there are, the schemes are similar. The type of gifts that are given to buy votes may improve in quality, but the mentality is more or less the same, So, which is a problem with the Indian democracy, I think, the way I experience it there. Only new technology, the arrival of Twitter, has been able to make the issue emerge because when Jayalalita uh, was absent during the recent emergency in the flooding in Chennai, if you remember a few years ago, I was in Chennai, it was two weeks without electricity. It was less fun than at my wedding. <laughs> uh, then uh, international NGOs started sending rice and food and, and aid to Tamil Nadu, but uh, her AIADMK volunteers were uh, ordered to put Jayalalita's image on top of the sacks of rice and aid so that it looked like this was coming from Jayalalita. Only because Twitter, in Twitter, they denounced this sort of behavior, then the general media had to speak about it. Otherwise, normally, it would not be known, this sort of phenomenon. So I, I don't think that this mentality is necessarily going to change just because there has been a change between AIA, DMK, and DMK. Uh, and yet, the South is rich, much richer than the North. There's been a lot of great development. Infrastructure is coming up. Uh, it takes me now an hour and uh, 20 minutes instead of an hour and, and 45 to get from Chennai to our house. Uh, there has been a lot of change and growth. This is what's so impressive in being in India instead of being in Europe. When I go back to the little dark rainy valley where I grew up in Italy, I see only more complaints and more decadence, whereas in India I see improvement constantly. I have a question um, from Christina Lam. Um, we read your Waiting for Allah when I just started graduate school at the new school in New York and we passed old. it around. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you surprised that Pakistan is still in a doghouse? Hmm, that's a, <laughs> how much time have you got? <laughs> um, in a two minutes. No, I'm very sad about, I mean, Pakistan has got some of the most amazing people I have ever met, but also, frankly, the worst politicians I have ever met. And I'm sorry if any of you here are politicians or related to Pakistani politicians, but um, I don't know how, what they've done to that country. And I think one of the saddest things the is... The Yes, <laughs> okay. Um, every time I go there, 
the same people are still running the country. They may have switched party or may... And, okay, Imran Khan, when I first went there, was a kind of party boy. Now he <laughs> de denies all of that. <laughs> and, um, um, but we all know that Imran Khan is not really running the country. Um, I'm very sad that my Pakistani journalistic colleagues tell me that this is the worst time that they've had as journalists since the darkest days of military dictatorship. One of my friends was telling me last week that on her TV program, if she mentions the army, the intelligence, opposition, it's all blanked out. So you just see the guests sort of mouthing things. Um, so she tells people before the show, please try and really enunciate so people could try and lip read what you were saying. <laughs> um, um, and this is very sad, you know, in Pakistan, I suppose to me, the greatest example of this is I'm obviously very close to Malala. I'm very much an admirer of Malala and any country on earth I think should be really proud to have somebody like that, the world's youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner, somebody who is advocating for girls and boys to go to school all over the world, 66 million currently outside of school, many of them sadly in Pakistan. Um, and yet the country or the, the government um, doesn't accept her and to many people there will say that, you know, I've had many conversations with people who say this is all a drama, that she was never really shot, that uh, she is a CIA stooge, you know, it's really, really sad. So I think until it becomes a country that can actually embrace someone like that and be proud to have somebody like that. Um, it's not going to really develop in the way that it ought to be. And yet one of the most beguiling countries. Yeah, absolutely. I've had the best experiences in my life there, I've said. Line for one more. Um, it's a long time since I read your City of Jinns, and I'd forgotten that you'd gone to Karachi. It reminded me of something I often wondered, whether for somebody living in Delhi, it's difficult to be curious about Pakistan, to write about it. Are you interested? Are you planning anything? I go backwards and forwards from India and Pakistan, love both. Um, and writing-wise and exploring? Uh, and, and, and now, increasingly, it's difficult to choose between the governments. <laughs> I'd be very hard-pressed to say which I prefer. Um, the, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the most curious relationships because I spent a lot of time, for example, in Israel-Palestine. Now, there it's very simple. They both absolutely hate each other. And if you take them out of the country, they hate each other out of the country. If you go to an American university, there's a Palestinian kid in the corridor, there's, a, there's an Israeli kid, they won't talk to each other. The opposite is true of India and Pakistan. You go to, uh, to an, American, an Indian kid goes to an American university, a Pakistani kid ends up in the same corridor. They're in each other's room on day one, um, and they, they're playing the same music, they're, they're fighting over the cricket, and they probably end up married by the end of a, 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 a single term. Um, and, it's, and it's very confusing. Indians go to India expecting to be scalped and raped, and instead they're unable to pay a single bill because the taxi drivers, the restaurants, refuse to take any money and just lo 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 cover them with food and, and love. And yet, you know, as we know, it's one of the most fissile relationships, both... Um, both um, governments half longing to lob nuclear missiles in either direction, it could go bang at any time. Um, and it's a, it's a very complicated one. To live in the middle of it is not easy. It's a, it's a complicated relationship. A big round of applause for Peter, Christina Lam, Manisha, and for Carlo, and William, of course. <laughs> 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 <laughs>